editor at Worth uh, Magazine. And um, I thought that uh, we've got 20 minutes, so I thought I would spend 10 or 15 saying what I think this panel is about. And then I'd get into it a little bit. Is that okay? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. That's absolutely not what we're going to be doing. Um, let me just quickly show you who we have here, and then I'm going to give them a little time to introduce themselves. We have uh, Daniela Fernandez of the Sustainable Ocean Alliance. Um, also, Georgetown University, which is mainly why I got her on the panel, but she does some other things that are pretty good too. Why is that so? Um, Rachel Floriani, Burlington Bio, um, and uh, Rachel Slaybaugh of uh, DCDC. Uh, yes, we have two Rachels. Um, I did a panel a while ago on AI, and we had two Charlies, so we know how to do this. Two panelists. <laughs> Um, but let me give each of you just um, like 30, 60 seconds sort of tell me like what you do and particularly in the current context and then we'll ask some more questions, go into some more detail about the project. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to share more about the ocean specifically, but also about the opportunities that we all have to be allies uh, to the ocean and climate. So I um, founded Sustainable Ocean Alliance at my college dorm room. When I was 19, so I was a 19-year-old student. <laughs> Thank you. And what happened was that I was invited to attend a meeting at the United Nations, and it was at this UN meeting when I realized that I had two realizations. The first one being that young people were not being invited to be a part of these crucial conversations, conversations that were taking place behind closed doors. And the second realization was that every single narrative that came out of the mouth of a head of state, of an ambassador or scientist, was about the problems. It wasn't about solutions. So I said to myself, okay, what if I can recruit an entire generation and have them roll up their collective sleeves to actually build solutions for our ocean and planet? And so that's what I decided to do. I um, uh, graduated from Georgetown, took a one-way plane ticket to Silicon Valley because I wanted to take all of the you know, mentality, the capital of Silicon Valley and bring it into the ocean and planet space. So that's what I've been doing um, so far. Um, yeah, um, oh, that was loud. Um, so I consider myself mainly an educator and an innovator. I am an associate professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Vermont, but I also recently, as mentioned, co-founded a company. What I try to do is um, break the norms, try and be someone that someone doesn't see right away. So when I wait, when I walk into a room, people will see somebody different than when I open my mouth. And I love that. And I actually get like a huge kick out of that. And I just continue to do it. So I don't tell myself no. And I just want to continue to provide solutions. Mostly I work in biotech and ag tech. But I want to continue to provide those solutions that open up avenues for brainstorming, for creativity, for younger women and girls. Really, that's my big thing. So I can be up here, we can talk about food security, but really, I'm up here because I'm so freaking proud of everyone in this room, of everyone who has ever talked to me, because I just want to keep talk, 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 and not up here with people. Well, I would love to talk with you forever, Sean. But I guess I need this. I love to talk. And it is be it's because, though, that even if it's just one of you in this room that is like, oh my god, like she said something that's pretty powerful. Let me go back and just like think about it. That's awesome. That's all I want to do. That's what I'm here for. That's what I do. So thank you. So I'm Rachel Slaybot, and we somehow managed to find two Rachels who are engineering professors and in entrepreneurship. So they have a good job working. Um, so I'm a nuclear engineer by training. I was a professor at Berkeley for eight years, and while I was doing that, I became a program director at ARPA-E, which is a office in the Department of Energy that does sort of early stage disruptive energy work, and I really love that, and that led me into venture capital. So now I'm a partner at DCBC. We're a deep tech venture capital firm, and I lead our uh, climate tech practice. So we have a climate specific fund, and I invest at Series B, Series C, so the panel that was before us, I'm really interested to talk with all of you just about plugging into that ecosystem and continuing to try to build diversity into the founders and uh, other executives at, at our company. So, uh, I, want, I 
I'm, I'm curious about a couple of things. One is because we have women working in various different fields around the environment, whether it's academics, whether it's um, small funding, whether it's large funding, whether it's uh, you know uh, biology, whether it's physics. Um, what is what's the environment like for women in the areas where you're either you're either working or you're supporting, and and, and like around the climate, like in terms of like opportunities getting better. Um, Barriers are still seen. Um, yeah, yeah, happy, yeah, yeah, happy to jump in. So, um, just to frame the work that we do, we have two programs. One program focuses on empowering young people all over the world. We have 10,000 young leaders in 168 countries. So, we have this global movement of change makers um, that are building their own grassroots solutions. Then on the other hand, we have this pipeline of for-profit ecopreneurs, as we call them, right? So they're entrepreneurs building solutions to impact the health of our planet and ocean. So that's the, I would say, the breadth of talent that we have, all with the purpose of how can we utilize our collective skill set to build solutions, whether it be grassroots or in a for-profit way. So given, having said that, I, I just want, I'm gonna run you through a couple of stories really quickly and then just have you imagine this, right? So imagine you are one of these solutionists, right? You're an entrepreneur, you're um, a grassroots leader. You walk into a room when it's, where, where there's a pool of investors, right? You have five investors that are male. And the moment you walk in, half of them walk outside the room just by looking at you. Imagine that after that, you go to a luncheon and you're talking about your solution. And one of the comments that is being made immediately is about your appearance. Imagine that after that you follow up with, say, um, said VC, and you're called too pushy for following up immediately. Imagine that after that you go to dinner with a potential investor, and you're not sure if he's trying to hit on you or trying to fund you. So I, I walk you through this because all of these obstacles are things that are happening right now as we speak, and these are things that these female entrepreneurs have experienced. And so what if all of those barriers, all of those issues that they're dealing with were not part of them building these solutions? What if they just didn't have to deal with that, right? So I, I want to get that nitty gritty because I think that there's so many unspoken things that happen to us as women that we don't have necessary mentors, allies, supporters to even just be able to speak up and talk about these problems. And then what's the opportunity cost? If these women are so held up by all of these barriers, what if they were funded immediately, right? What if they were able to reach their full potential? So in the funding cycle, we're seeing a lot of women ecopreneurs that are being held back, not because they're not prepared, not because they don't have you know, um, the credentials or because they don't have a product, it's because of their gender. And I think that's a conversation that's worth having from the perspective of how can we accelerate the rate of their adoption of their companies, but also how can we get more funding into their hands, and how can we also build more self-confidence, self-education, like how can we help them build a circle of women mentors that can truly be there for them every step of the way. We have another VC on the panel here, and I'm curious, the question that she's addressing the women entrepreneurs face from the funding community. How is the funding community trying to address sort of these historical challenges? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, the, you know, the previous panel talked to this a little bit as well. It's, it's kind of a mixed bag. There are starting to be some firms and funds specifically focused on increasing diversity, or at least it's in their, their metrics. For a lot of groups, it's not that part of the conversation, to be honest. I think a lot of people, maybe it's an afterthought, maybe they talk about it sometimes. So it's, I think we're not doing a great job sort of in the larger venture ecosystem, but that's part of why we're here having these conversations, right? And there are some of these groups that are trying to do a better job. Like at my firm, we don't, similarly to uh, Coldwater, like we don't have specific metrics but we do try to put in the extra effort on the pipeline building. Um, we also try to help in ways that are broader than just looking at founders. So we help with recruiting <coughs> diverse independent board members. We help with when our companies are hiring executives, helping make sure they have diverse candidates in their executive pool. So that even if the founder isn't a diverse person, we're putting diverse people on the leadership team and that is hopefully helping the, the culture inside of the company, 
is helping create people who will go be founders later, board members later. So we're trying to sort of overall tackle the ecosystem. And I, I think, I mean, to, um, oh, now I can't remember who said it, but the point about at this, you know, we invest at Series C and Series D, there aren't that many women founders by the time they make it to Series B and Series C. And so we're also looking at what are all these other strategies that we can use to try to help build out diversity in teams. Yeah, that's something that's interesting because you were talking about you doing a lot of like um, C type investing, maybe up to Series A, and then we have this sort of donut hole, right, where, you know, like we, it gets across from like a hundred thousand, twenty five thousand, hundred thousand dollar, I think, you know, up to like 15 million, 100 million. Um, what can we do to fill in that gap there? I mean, I, I think the first thing is um, de-risking capital and getting other investors in the space to not be that risk averse. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of education that needs to be needs to be had, and I'll just give you um, the, the the biggest ally in our fight against climate change is the ocean. And most people don't realize that the ocean is absorbing 30% of the carbon in the atmosphere, right? The ocean is absorbing 90% of heat in the atmosphere, right? The ocean is actually feeding 3.1 billion people on the planet. You have ecotourism in the industry, you have shipping as an industry, you have fashion as an industry. So all of these industries are, are up for disruption in every single category. And when you look at traditional investment firms and VCs, they look at the ocean like, oh, no, that's philanthropic, right? We're, we're not here to save the corals. We're here to make money. And the argument we're trying to make is you can do both. And frankly, those investors that are putting in the capital in right now, they're going to see increased financial returns and impact returns on investments. So we do not have enough founders, actually funders in that space to be able to deploy patient capital, to be able to risk the capital in the space, because this industry is very nascent, right? There hasn't been a you know many billion dollar exits, although we do have you know a lot of um, secondary exits that are happening. So I think we need time to prove the model works, but we also need capital to be deployed in a way that in trillion dollars worth of growth worth of capital, right? There's um two hundred billion dollars worth of capital being deployed right now into nature positive solution and $3 trillion dollars worth of capital being deployed in some negative solutions in the space a year, right? So how do we bridge the gap between the $200 billion and $3 trillion? Um, Rachel F., uh, with a new startup, what's it been like for you to try to get funding being taken seriously? And is it any different in different industries? Like I think you were saying that the food is maybe a little more sort of gender positive than oh. other sectors, for instance? Or? Oh, well. Um, Okay, so I'll address the first thing sure. you brought up, being a funder and finding funding. Okay, um, okay, so yeah, being a woman, right, uh, no. being a woman, it's very, very hard to walk into the room when the investors are expecting to meet Dr. Floriani. So I'll be in the room, the investors will walk in, I'll stand up and they'll say, cool, when's Dr. Floriani gonna be here? And at that moment, I am just like, I have a poop point to prove. Um, that is super frustrating though. Throughout my entire education, being an engineering professor, I feel like I always have to prove something. When I came here today and right now, my attitude has shifted slightly to trying to be the female founder, trying to be um, a role model, I mean like, yes, I can fight, I can do it. Now what I'm starting to recognize is that to build this community is I actually should try and search for female investors. Like I, I, we have investors and they are white men and I'm very appreciative of that. But I am also very much aware because of today that that is not going to help create wealth within this community. So now addressing that second point. I come traditionally from tissue engineering, from biomedical engineering, and it's recently sort of maneuvered into food. What I've noticed is that when I have done traditional engineering, or even in medicine, which is still that a lot of the biotech is, is run by men, when I start talking about food or when I start engaging in cellular agriculture, I'm finding a lot more women. 
The reason being what has been brought up already today. We make decisions about food, we make decisions about the health and the care of our families. And so being in the food area, now being made more aware that I need to look for females across the board, I'm actually energized. I am one of those people where if I am the only female in the room, I feel empowered to make a point. Here, I'm way more empowered. Okay, let me just make that clear. I'm way more empowered being here because I hope that all of us go out there and make a point. And that is really, I, I just want to pay it forward. When I think about my biggest role, so not only as a co-founder, CTO, but really as an educator across the board, is I just want to make people aware that like we care, you should invest in us, not only in a company, but in really what everyone's been saying so far, and trying to go after money. <laughs> So being an engineering, I was like, oh, this has got to be the worst ratio, right? I'm going to go to business, there's going to be so many more women. This would be great. No, there's not. Um, I have only made it here because of our allies. I would say our male colleagues, our allies that have gotten me here. But I, I am going to stay here because of women. And I, what I think I'm hearing is that staying here, digging my heels into the ground, continuing to prove a point is critical. Because if I don't get to that series, series C or series D, then maybe many other women won't because they won't see me. Does that make sense? Like I am, I am so driven to get there. Yeah, and it's not just even building my own community. Like I really truly believe in representation. I really truly do. And so I think now it is not only look, not only like raw right from women, but really searching them out. Deliberately, female investors. So all of you female investors. <laughs> so Rachel asked a couple things I wanted to ask you. One would be, not to put you on the spot, but how do we get from our series B up from our series A up to like where you're funding? Like we do. Is there any advice or anything you think we need to change like structurally to get these like eco entrepreneurs out there? I mean one, I, I'm not an expert in, look at, there are people who are experts in how do you kind of, all the cultural and systemic change that needs to happen. I, I have a PhD in nuclear engineering, it's different. <laughs> yeah. all, uh, all. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it is a lot of the work that we can do, which is, in, you know, the truisms of introduce people into your network. When people like me who have these larger dollars a little later stage take the extra beat to try to go and give an extra meeting to a diverse founder, um, go try to look into pipelines that we wouldn't normally look in, I, I think that's part of it. Um, you know, the broader cultural norm of like how do we help people be, women be more supported is sort of beyond what I can accomplish individually. Um, so I, I don't have great answers that isn't the like give warm intros and go try, you know, take the extra meeting or do the extra step of diligence. And I, I think maybe what I said before, that secondary solution of for your company, try to help them have good diverse hiring practices, help them hire diverse executive teams, help them get diverse board members, like just the more we can build it together and have, you know, like Make sure they have a good family leave policy. Make sure they have health care policies that are trans inclusive. You know, all that kind of stuff I think helps, but there's not a magic bullet. Something I'm curious about too is I think there's a there's a notion that, you know, I guess we've got me time for one more question here. Um, is that, you know, climate eco is a more sort of progressive or more open, maybe a more warm and fuzzy kind of sector. Um, but but is it when it comes to gender, or or maybe even just representation in general, or does it still sort of feel like it's any other, any, any of you, you know, you're, what you're seeing? And there are way more female VCs in climate than in other sectors that I've noticed, and it does tend to be more collaborative. Hmm. And so I think that can feel helpful 
and it can feel more empowering for women to stay in the space because it is more of like we all want everyone to win because of the planet. Yeah, you experience that also racial Yeah, I mean, I, I am here because women have reached out to me because they genuinely care. And I don't know if it's because they have come to a previous meeting or summit, but the women who talk to me and encourage me just want me to get out there because they want to see their efforts and their dreams come true. I'm not saying that like, you know, I'm, they're living vicariously for me, but just like me as an educator, if I can teach a student and she can go out there and she can be an engineering manager and run a Fortune 500, freaking amazing. That's what I want. And so instead of, eh, you know, oh, I'm not worth it. When women come to me and they say, you can do this, we want you to do this, I do it for me and I do it for them. Because we all need to believe that like we're, we're making a difference. And so if someone comes to me, and multiple women have come to me, and I'm so blessed to have known them, when they say, hey, we think you should do this, you could do this. And then I do it, and they come back, and they're like, yes, that worked, I'm gonna do it again. That matters, it matters a lot. And so it's, I want, I want to be selfish, but at the same time, I just, I really think that at every stage of our career, from when we're in our college dorm room to, you know, conducting a symphony or an orchestra, I just think we have to remember that for most of us in this room, we do care. We care. And whether you're male or you're female, you have to at least believe that we do deserve a seat at the table. And I think that's been discussed multiple times. So I am kind of new to business, series A, series whatever, like I'm kind of a cap table. I was making a joke earlier about cap, no cap, right? Like I had a teenager, okay. I didn't know these things, but that didn't matter. It's almost like I still had women saying, you can do this, you have an idea, go for it, you'll learn as you go. It is true, it's true. So if we stay as a group, we can teach each other as we go. We don't have to wait until we're all ready. I think that's important. If you don't mind just adding to yeah, that, sure. that we, we, we just don't have enough women in every sector. Like that's just the reality of it, right? And so we need more women role models. I can't tell you how many times I've had women give women like, I know that I can be a global leader or a VC or because I see you doing it, right? So we need more role models. And last but not least, we just need to get capital in the hands of women, period. If you want a silver bullet, that's it. Put capital in the hands of women, whether it be venture philanthropy, grant making, right? Like early stage financing, just put the money there and then let's support them in making their journey come true, their dream come true, which is going to be beneficial to all of us. That's a good wrap up, I think. Thank you. Okay.